Thank you um, for this wonderful invitation, um, Sonic Acts and Nick, and also for John, uh, to John for um, for starting us off with this thinking. Um, a lot of paradoxes already in the air. Um, but when uh, Nick spoke about uh, the Zen Zenos paradoxes, I was actually thinking about another, which was the second, um, where it's not simply a moment of, uh, where it's not about the impasse or the stasis, but the, the paradox that talks about um, Achilles and the tortoise. And it's in this one, it's also the constant play, the catch up, that is this impossible distance to cover. And this, in a sense, starts up um, my inquiry, which is how to engage with the question of um, the strong and the weak, the kind of parallel forces of evil that present us with a, a kind of multiplicity, a kind of um, um, a, a constant mutation that makes this question of justice uh, a, a particularly difficult one for us um, to answer to, forget answer to, but even just to engage um, with as, uh, as, as, as cultural subjects today. So since I happen to be two, about two weeks away from opening a Biennale, um, this is what is preoccupying me entirely. And so I would propose to um, think through this question of justice through some of the work that we are uh, involved in right now. And the, what I call it, what I put in the subject here, the planetary records. And what are these planetary records through which we consider the question of justice? These planetary records are not simply records of um, environmental justice or e ecocide um, and the knot of ecocide that we find ourselves in, but also records that include, say, video evidence of police br brutality against racialized subjects or um, documents and records of um, the self-immolation of Tibetan subjects. Um, so these are not a question straightforward of certain kinds of rights or certain, certain um, aspect of the Anthropocene um, that perpetuates a kind of um, nature-culture divide with, where John rightly said also, um, it's something that pro gives away agency from the human to other kinds of um, other other kinds of subjectivity, but also something that cannot be um, cancelled out. Something that will be dealt with for a very very long um, time. So, in addressing um, Contour Biennial Eight, which is called Polyphonic Worlds: Justice as Medium. Polyphonic worlds, in a sense, also I think ties in with the, the noise of being to some extent. Um, and justice as medium is, is um, in a sense, also looking at uh, tipping points as this way of thinking of how um, justice itself is not an end. It is not um, something that can be singularly um, evoked, but the medium around which we constantly uh, do the work of of uh, proposing evidence, of staging testimony, and of interrupting the course of the law. This painting here um, is the opening session of the Parliament of Mechelen uh, under Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy. Um, and it's a painting that I see as a sort of civilizing um, site. It is a painting that presents, is presented as an image architecture in the city council of Mechelen to assemble around, even today, um, emblematically transacting the structural hierarchy of city governance. So against the background of this um, Flemish city's um, historical role as a legal stronghold for medieval Europe, we take this example of what was called the Great Council, the highest court um, in the Low Countries, with a 400-year-old juridical record, until the French Revolution came. It is the space from which the law was not only spoken, but enacted as a regional force across Dutch, German, and French territories. From the vestiges of Europe's first court then, what might it mean to survey the field of social justice and its implements 
as media archaeology, such that justice itself is considered a medium that is performative, ethical, and aesthetic. As Denise Ferrer de Silva has said, um, who is also an advisor um, to me in this Biennale effort, we now face the limits of justice, her term, which unravels as a volatile crisis. And this is when you talk about um, the, the volatility, the turbulence um, within the global present. So how may a Biennale um, examine and unravel formalizations in the character of the witness and testimonial production, the architecture of the trial, as well as the role of fiction and orality in forwarding evidence. The emphasis for us lies on human experience, lived encounters, and material environments, rather than a unilateral obsession with the abstract, formless subject of the law. The ways of speech making and silencing that operate within the realm of jurisprudence and the state's many faces of regulatory authority become addressed through artistic production. I also think within, um, within the work we're doing, we're looking at how to depart from the Western construction of international law into a broader network of legal environments and lawmaking practices which face this violent threshold um, between legal and illegal subjects in today's Europe. While moving away from magic, cosmology, and sorcery towards the enlightened plane of rational jurisprudence and pragmatic rule to mobilize citizens as legal subjects, the tenets of modern law that are rapidly unfurling before us were initially established through the machinations of war, colonialism, violent rivalry amidst rulers, and competitive industrialization in the lowlands. So from this site, this map, we ask, how may a disappeared court speak to the global imperatives of a co common European region, of those repressed histories, and then a world made prone to systemic rupture? This is a painting that I really love, um, which is by the Dutch painter Marinus van Reemers um, Sweller which is called The Lawyer's Office. Um, and it shows the lawyer um, with his hands raised giving elaborate explanations. Um, and his, uh, his clerk who's writing away busily without looking at the subjects who stand up front, where you see the money rolling onto the table, um, which is a satire on the greed uh, um, and the corruption of the legal profession, which was proliferant, uh, which proliferated across the, the Netherlands, these kind of um, black humor around uh, the role of the lawyer, uh, more self-serving than serving the public. Um, and the documents that are actually in the background represent an actual case, um, a lawsuit for a property, uh, which began in, in 1526, but was not resolved till 1538. And by this time, the property that was disputed was already destroyed by storms. Another point of inspiration um, for me when talking about tipping points, but also within the, the, the Biennial polyphonic worlds, is, is polyphonic music itself, um, which is integral to the medieval and late medieval Flemish culture. But this is not simply about musicality. It is also about the figures of power and distinction that uh, connected scribes um, to nobility um, and composers to architecture of the royal court and the church to the street. Within the Biennale, we consider how the notion of polyphony also operates as a parallel field of resonance and as a lens through which to observe a multiplicity across narrative formation of utterances that voice injustice as well as the ways in which witnessing um, accounts for the unspoken, the, the unarticulated, but also the kind of traumas that are unable to be spoken. So this, we consider how through, this is actually a slide that was presented by um, my designer, Studio Remko van Bladel, who has um, constructed the entire um, graphic identity for the PNL. And he looks um, for reference toward the fugue, which has these three parts. 
um, as a contrapuntal um, composition. So also this way of speaking in counterpoint, which starts with the exposition, the development, and the recapitulation. And also that, in a sense for me, performs this exhibition methodology of how one can take up these positions. I'm now going to talk about a very specific case, which is also um, an artistic project that is in the Biennale, um, and show you um, a video, uh, which is uh, by Inhabitants. Inhabitants uh, was initiated as a platform, um, an online channel for exploratory video and documentary reporting by Pedro Nils Marquez and Mariana Silva. It is the online uh, channel also of Contour Biennale 8, for which uh, the group presents three episodes. What they're dealing with here is um, how to traverse the current regimes of hypervisibility and the immersive image um, appearing within new subgenres of journalism today. Developing expanding techniques of reportage while also refusing or refracting from the media images um, that, 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 that justify themselves through clickbait um, as a primary unit of measurement. The particular uh, case uh, that they that discuss um, within this episode um, that is called Hobby Lobby versus the Allegory of Justice um, points us toward the allegorical figurations and tropes of justice, the scale that allows balanced judgment, the body of justice as female perpetually set against the concept of the legal fictitious person. In particular, it puts in perspective the abstract body of justice in relation to the status attributed to corporations for juridical purpose under the United States Code of Law. Historical images are thus found spliced to the tone of feminist post-punk bands and composers while drawing upon the 2014 US Supreme Court legal case granting religious rights to the craft supply chain Hobby Lobby stores, which as many of you may know, is a, is a great supporter of the current United States presidential regime. And in this landmark case, the five to four ruling um, applied to companies owned by Christian families, two companies, which paved the door to challenge the Affordable Care Act, and moreover, for corporations to further lay claims on violations to their religious liberty. The ruling in favor of corporate rights made it possible for the company to deny its federal obligation to provide contraceptive health care to its female employees. Judge Neil uh, Gorsuch, Trump's nominee for the Supreme Court, voted with a majority of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals in favor of privately held for profit secular corporations and individuals who owned, to con owned or controlled them who raised religious objections to paying for contraception for women covered under their health plans. He wrote um, in, a, in an opinion, in a, in a, uh, opinion about this moral dilemma um, facing this family that uh, runs Hobby Lobby. And I quote, as they understand it, ordering their companies to provide insurance coverage for drugs or devices whose use is inconsistent with their faith itself violates their faith representing a degree of complicity their, their religion disallows. I mean, just thinking about the, the kind of language that is used, the kind of, uh, the way in which such a case is, is, is propped up, because um, as I've said, this particular uh, judgment grants religious freedom protection to, for the first time, to, commercial profit make, uh, to the commercial profit-making world. And through this, um, and through this record, means that the common law judges um, not only apply to this particular exemplary case, but it also sets up um, a precedent for corporations, and this is how what inhabitants argues as well, to practice a faith, which may um, affect not just the the autonomy of women, but various other. Um, racialized subjects as well within the way that our society is governed today and the United States. Um, so I'm going to play the episode. Huh? 
Did you read the letter? Yeah, yeah this one is the first one. Do you? Yeah. Do you think?
Um, I'm going to make a jump. Um, I have a second um, artistic work that I want to show you, with just to give you background on this, because um, within uh, within the way that um, the question of justice is addressed, there's also it's been it's been important for us to think about what kind of um, methodologies are incorporated uh, within what kind of working methodologies are incorporated within um, within this project. So one particularly uh, important uh, kind of practice that I've been involved with now for about four years is that of the Karabing Film Collective, um, in, who work in Beluen, in, uh, near Darwin, Northern Territory, Australia. It's a, a group um, of uh, an intergenerational group. I think the youngest member is about eight years old. Um, the oldest is senior citizen. Um, it's it's uh, they work as a as a crew together setting up uh, films uh, with their founding member Elizabeth Povanelli, um, anthropologist, uh, professor at Columbia. This particular collective practice, um, to me, stands very much for this idea of justice as medium, um, precisely because. Their films enable um, a methodology to um, address the neoliberal um, settler state in ways that the uh, land politics, um, the kind of um, genealogical formations that the state pushes onto the community are constantly ruptured, are um, are reframed and through cinematic strategies are countered again and again, which is not something that always works when you set up, um, uh, give a pile of documents. And so this, uh, these films I see as these planetary records is this, that replace, in a sense, the official legal uh, document um, and yet present the, the the real uh, daily circumstances um, of uh, encountering right from the police to the minor um, within this particular um, territory. So um, what, what this, this, uh, some of these photographs were taken uh, when I was doing um, a visit with the community. So we are, there were films being made as well um, while we were uh, visiting, there was, um, so you see sound recording happening there um, with the, that's Sherry, one of the members of the collective. Um, below there's a, a meeting being held. So there's a lot of horizontal discussions um, where the script, the, the, the location, and all of these strategies are discussed collectively, um, uh, mostly sitting on the, on, on the ground. Um, and, uh, and, and then you also have uh, the group where we're watching one of the films with this television propped up uh, on a refrigerator in uh, someone's garage. Um, so this is, these are the kind of ways in which, in parallel to the making of the work, there's also its circulation that is going on um, within the within the community as a parallel process. Uh, the the film that I'm going to show a clip from um, is the second from their trilogy, uh, which is called Winjamaru, um, The Stealing Kans, made in 2015. Uh, their third film, Butar Saltwater Dreams, um, is currently on view, uh, or is was on view recently at the Berlinale Forum Expanded. And within this particular trilogy, which is called the Intervention Trilogy, um, Elizabeth Povanelli forwards the term uh, toxic sovereignty. And she thinks about this term um, as, uh, as, as an analytic to understand uh, the ways in which the Karabing um, life worlds um, unfold. Um, examining the structures of late liberal settler governance, um, but also uh, considering how these justice claims are made, um, where sovereignty from the state, and this is why she she considers this toxic sovereignty term, because the state provides the doubled poison where the freedom to be sovereign over their country can only exist so long as a sovereignty is in a form that the state demands. 
and that freedom is is to be a f uh, to be an underclass um, within settler neoliberalism. So, what does it mean then to interrupt the composition of indigenous worlds and and create these uh, terms of endurance in the face of rampant dispossession? Hey, if I get that ball, we'll go fishing at this creek or what? When we get paid. Fella, how much you all you? Fine. 1,332 cents. How much you all now? 500. Oh, how good that is. And you would read the police up here, what for? Them little shit trays and chuck them a beer can at me. Well, I'm painting. How can I find that you've done it too? Very fine at reminding there. You are over. Chama, when you're drunk, you got a big mouth. Hey, Nagarani. The retaining room, freaking area here. Nah, we're all just mining around here. I don't trust eating this food. Might come out with two heads. It's only been 32 degrees. In fact, if you ask oh, me, the wind's going to blow in here. 29th of July and 2050. Oh, it's feeding again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's feeding again. 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 It's
Hey, if I get that ball. Um, I've kind of used up all my time, but I just wanted to mention that um, that the the name Karabing itself, um, it it's not representative of a specific uh, site or a, a a clan as such. Um, it's a it's in the Emi Angal term for uh, when the tide is at its lowest. Um, and it is a, that it is in a sense also this a, a kind of tipping point, but a point of possibility um, where the mangroves uh, surface um, and where there are crossings that are possible um, at, at that very particular threshold point. Um, so yeah, this was this was where I'd like to end. Thanks. <laughs>